Thanks so much for joining us today at Eastwood Tulsa, the place to believe, belong, and be loved. As you watch our live stream today, we invite you to join in and worship with us. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you through His Word and His presence. As you do, we believe that God will hear your prayer, meet you where you are, and do a powerful work in your life today. Once again, thanks for joining us. We take you now to our live service already in progress.
Father, that's our prayer this morning. That you would open our eyes. Father, even in the midst of uh, trials and tribulations, Father, that you would open us to the fact that you are there with us, that you walk every step of the way with us. Father, our prayer is that you would open our eyes even when we're on the mountaintop and everything is going well. Father, that we would see you at work, that we would see your hand on our lives, that we would give you praise for what you are doing. Father, we pray that you would open our eyes when you present us with opportunities to, to minister to people, to share the gospel. Father, we pray that our eyes would be open to your leading. song one more time church open our eyes lord again that you are you are present in this place Father I thank you for the way you've even spoken to me this morning Father I pray as a pastor comes and as we have a speaker Father open our hearts to hear the message that you would have God we pray that we would leave this place changed by what you have to say to us. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Good morning. Is my mic on? I can't tell. So I am so excited to be here. I've been excited to be here since 30 seconds after Gordon invited me to come. And uh, every time I come back, it's like old home week, a lot of familiar faces. J.C. Herring, one of my heroes for more than 20 years, the first guy that told me about Bangladesh, uh, is here this morning. I told J.C. before the service, I've now been to Bangladesh about 20 times, and I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Bangladesh is a very difficult place, but brother, to have you here means a great deal to me uh, this morning. I I'm excited about this morning. Today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, and we here this morning are gathering with Christians around the world to pray for those who are going through very difficult days for the name of Jesus. So it's a, it's a humbling thing for us to be able to, to join with Christians around the world in lifting up our persecuted family uh, around the world. And I'm excited after I finish, at, during the off tour, we'll have a video that Voice of the Martyrs produced uh, that will give you a picture of what life is like in Pakistan for our brothers and sisters. And then Jim Hudson, who many of you know, will come and, and lead us in prayer. Uh, when I found out I was going to be here, and Jim, some of you know this, some don't, Jim came to work for VOM in May. In May of this year is our Director of Global Technical Services. It's a very impressive title. It basically means that he keeps everything working and secure, which is a big deal for us. So it's exciting to have Jim here. And then for Gordon to invite me to preach and then loan me his reading glasses. I'm officially old enough now. I, I, some of you know I'm a Bible snob, so I, it always bugs me when people read the scripture from their phone or their tablet. 
If you do that, that's fine. It's just not for me. And I got here this morning and started feeling on top of my head for reading glasses, and they weren't there. Gordon came to the rescue and uh, gave some reading glasses, so I'm thankful for that. Uh, Just for those who don't know who I am, my name is Jonathan Ekman. Some of you know me by another name. That's fine. Uh, But Jonathan Ekman and I have the privilege of leading the international work for Voice of the Martyrs. And what that looks like is a staff of about 67 people, uh, 25 nationalities based in 24 countries around the world. Uh, We're doing about 1,600 projects this year in 70 countries. So our job at the Voice of the Martyrs, one is to inform the American church, like this morning with the video and, and resources that we have. But on my side of the house, our job is this. We want to respond to persecution. When our brothers and sisters are persecuted, we at Voice of the Martyrs want to replace what was lost. We want to come alongside them, encourage them, strengthen them, help them to get back in the fight. Uh, Advancing the kingdom, coming alongside indigenous networks, networks of Indians and, and just all kinds of folks, indigenous folks, to help them take the gospel farther. And that looks like motorbikes and bicycles and all kinds of stuff. And then the third thing is Bibles. We'll distribute about 1.2 million Bibles this year, which I know for the Gideons in the crowd is not a big number, uh, but where we're putting them are the most difficult and hostile fields in the world. So it's it's a tremendous privilege for us to be able to do that, to be able to hand people a Bible who've never had one, who have always wanted one, and to be able to give that to them. So I've just started my eighth year at Voice of the Martyrs. It's hard to believe that I've been gone that long. But my eighth year, and God has given me this unique front row seat to what he's doing in the earth. Every morning I come to my office, and thanks to Jim and his team, I have email. And I have emails from all over the world, hearing stories of both tremendous suffering and tragedy, but also incredible triumph as the gospel continues to move forward. So I say this everywhere I go. If you don't take notes, that's fine, but I want you to write this down. As as an eyewitness to what God is doing in the earth, these are without question the most exciting days to be alive in the history of the church. Say it again, these are without question the most exciting days to be alive in the history of the church. And if you don't feel that, if you don't see that, if you look around and say, oh, it's awful, let me give you a piece of advice. Turn off your television, stop watching news all the time, pick up your Bible, and pay attention to what God is doing in the earth because God is moving like never before all across the world. And we have the privilege of being part of God's family. We are the body of Christ. And this morning, I want to encourage you with the idea that it's not that there's a free church and a persecuted church, right? It's really that there's one body. And and Hebrews 13.3 says, remember those in chains as if in chains with them. So what I want to do this morning is I, I just want to give you, tell you some stories about our family around the world. And I I love the book of Acts. I've taught the book of Acts for a long time. Wow, these are good reading glasses. Wow. But I want you to turn with me. We're going to look at the birth of the church, the very first church. And then I'm going to tell you stories how these exact same things are still going on today and give you examples of our brothers and sisters. So if you have your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 2. And I don't know if you guys still do this, but would you stand as we read God's word? One of the things I've learned is this is a precious, precious book. So we're going to begin in verse 41. So Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Then they that received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for the privilege that we have to gather together as the body of Christ. Father, to be able to read your word, to be able to fellowship together, to be able to worship together. And Lord, I pray you would help us in this room to never take that for granted, to never miss an opportunity to come before your throne and to come together and worship. So Father, this morning, I pray that you would be glorified as we talk about your body. 
And Lord, I pray that the people in this room would be encouraged and challenged by their brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, A real quick update. Several people have asked me. Jan is not here this morning. She's teaching Sunday school, which those who know her think that makes perfect sense. That's what Jan does. Joshua, our son, is 25 now. He's in Nepal with Youth with a Mission. That's his thing now. He's kind of followed in the family business. Uh, So he's in Nepal training storytellers in how to tell the, share the gospel. Jordan is still in Kansas, no, Missouri. Yes, Sweet Springs, Missouri, uh, where she is a barista and the chief baker at Old School Coffee Company. So the kids are doing great. Jan sends her greetings, sorry she couldn't get here. I failed to tell Jan that we were, I was coming to Eastwood until like Thursday. And uh, she was already committed to teach, so that's my fault. But. Let's talk about this body of Christ, this family (coughs) that was birthed in one day. In one day, we see 3,000 people come into the church, and the church begins to flourish. And that flourishing continues today. And there's four things I just want to share with you briefly about this body of Christ that we see around the world. And my hope is that these stories will encourage you. I hope they will challenge you. I will tell you this, I've met now with hundreds and hundreds of persecuted Christians, and not one time have they ever asked for our pity. They're not looking for you when you read our newsletter, when you hear us tell stories, they're not looking for you to say those poor pitiful people on the other side of the world, right? What do they ask us for? Prayer. Almost the first thing they ask us for every time is, would you pray for me? So we want to pray for them this morning. That's the reason we are here on this day. So I I don't want you to feel sorry, but I do want you to be challenged by your brothers and sisters. Your brothers and sisters would see these stories as the normal Christian life, and I pray that we would as well. Sometimes they seem very different than our experiences. I I joke sometimes, not really joke, I say sometimes, when I come home from some of these trips and I go to my church, it almost feels like a different religion. It, It seems much, I, I, you would just have to go. Those of you who have been know that there's just something about the body of Christ around the world. So I want to share with you four things that I, I find in this church. One is a passion for Jesus. A passion for Jesus. And that passion is not expressed in whatever the latest Bethel song is, right? Which I love Bethel, but it's not about getting together and getting a warm fuzzy. It's about service and it's about doing what God would ask us to do. This summer I was in Lebanon, where we're working with Syrian refugees, Iraqi refugees on the Syrian-Lebanese border. And I got to meet a brother and his wife and their three kids that really kind of rocked me, honestly. This brother, Saudi, well-to-do Saudi man, has a dream, a vision of Jesus. And he sneaks into Yemen, right? Yemen's one of the worst places on the planet. Sneaks into Yemen to try to find a church. He finds a church, they won't talk to him because they don't know who he is and don't trust him. And he comes back, he ends up, it's a long story, but he ends up coming to know Jesus. His wife shortly thereafter comes to know Jesus and they are driven out of their country, out of their family, their family completely cut them off. They're now living as refugees in Lebanon and honestly their prospects are not good. What's going to happen to them, right? They've lost everything. And I asked this brother a question I ask a lot of times when I talk to these folks, if you knew now what it would cost you, would you still have followed Jesus? If you knew now, if you knew that if I make this decision, it's not that people might think I'm odd, but I'm gonna lose everything, family, future, money, everything. And he smiled at me and he said this, and no one has ever said this to me before. He he looked at me and he said, absolutely. He said, have you seen Jesus? He's beautiful, right? I've never heard anyone describe Jesus that way in that context. Have you seen Jesus? He's beautiful. Of course we would make that decision again. This is that passion for Jesus that would drive us not just to make a simple decision on a Sunday morning, but to to risk our lives, to put our lives on the line for this beautiful Jesus who has appeared to this brother in a dream. Another example, and I may have told this here before, I don't know, but this story happened to me. I grew up here at Eastwood, those of you who don't know me, my earliest memories of life are at this church, right? Uh, I remember when Children's Church was at Lindbergh, right, and Ruffin, and we'd sing, does your chewing gum lose its flavor on the bedpost overnight? Some of you remember that song. 
So I grew up in this church, and I used to, in a weird way, kind of pride myself on the fact that no one outside of a church had ever shared the gospel with me. Never. I'd never had someone come to my house and say, can we tell you about Jesus? I'd never had anyone in a park or at the office, anywhere. And I I thank God for Eastwood because that being the case, I would be a pagan today if it weren't for this church because no one had ever told me. So a couple years ago, I'm in a Rumshi, China, which is far Western China. It's really completely closed to missionaries now. If you look in the news, you'll see some of that. I'm in a room she and we're meeting with some Muslim background believers. It's a very difficult place. We had to sneak around a lot, a lot of weird meetings. So I'm leaving a room she flying to Inner Mongolia, and I stand out in a room she, right? I, I don't look Chinese, and not only do I not look Chinese, I don't look Chinese Muslim. I'm a big, aggressively built white guy. And I'm getting, sitting on this plane, and the last thing I want to do on that flight is have anyone talk to me. Right? The last question I want to hear is, so what are you doing in a room sheet? Right? Because I would rather not lie to someone on a plane on a mission trip. Right? That seems wrong. So I, I do what I always do. I put my headphones in and I get out a book and I don't make eye contact with anyone. And I'm just reading my book. There's a young Chinese girl sitting next to me. Young Chinese girl. This is how old I am. She's probably in her mid-20s. And she's sitting there and we're taxiing. We haven't even taken off. And she taps me on the shoulder. And she says, excuse me, sir. And I'm like, uh, you know, I put out, I take my headphones out. And she says, do you know Jesus? And I stunned me, right? I mean, what do you say? I'm like, uh, yeah, I, I know Jesus. She goes, so you're a Christian? Yes, ma'am, I'm a Christian. See, you can see I've already reverted, right? I'm a 50-something white fat guy, and I'm telling a 25-year-old Chinese woman, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I talked to her like she's my mom the whole conversation. Yes, ma'am, I, I am a Christian. She said, are you a good Christian? And I said, I think so. I mean, how do you answer that question, right? I I think so. And she said, well, do you pray every day? Oh, yes, ma'am. I pray every day. Do you read your Bible every day? Yes, ma'am. I I read my Bible every day. Do you tell people about Jesus every day? Oh, no, ma'am. I'm sorry. I I don't do that. She said, I will pray for you. And I thought, okay, great. So so we have this little conversation. Then she says, I'm going to talk to this man. You should pray. And she turns to this Chinese businessman who's on the window and she starts talking to him about Jesus. She turns back about 10 minutes later and says, I told him about Jesus, but he doesn't believe. So we should pray for him. So we did. We sat on an airplane at 30,000 feet over China and prayed for a lost Chinese businessman. Now, this passion for Jesus I'm talking about, could you imagine doing that? Do you know how much trouble she could get into, right? Doing this kind of thing, this open evangelism. I found out later that her husband is on the same flight, but he's one row over and up. And can you guess what seat he's in? Middle seat. And what's he doing? Sharing the gospel with people. She said, every time we fly, we we sit apart and we share the gospel with people on the plane. That blew me away. Sometimes people say, why is the church growing so fast in China? Because a 25-year-old girl will tap an American businessman on the shoulder and say, do you know Jesus? I was reminded of you, Gordon. You used to talk to me about Sometimes we, think, we talk about evan- uh, relational evangelism, relational evangelism. I've got to build a bridge so I can share the gospel with someone. And you used to say, the longer you build the bridge, the harder it is to walk across. And she's like your hero. She's like the patron saint of the Gordon Small evangelism method, right? <laughs> Just walk up to somebody and tap them on the shoulder and say, do you know Jesus? It's a pretty, you're in the conversation then, right? There's not a lot of fudging around. I mean, you're just, you're there, right? It's right there. Just jump in. I, I want to tell you, it, it is this passion for Jesus that would drive someone to do that. And I am humbled by that. I hope you are too. Can you imagine? I'll give you homework. I know this isn't homeschool or anything, but your, here's your homework assignment this week. It's the International Day of Persecu- for the Persecuted Church, a prayer for the persecuted church. So I'm going to give you a homework assignment that may get you persecuted a little bit. Just, to, just dip your toe in. Sometime this week, I challenge you, Walk up to somebody, anybody, and tap them on the shoulder and say, do you know Jesus? And if they say no, say, can I tell you what he's done for me? Right? You don't have to jump into the Roman road and, you know, why Peter wore long robes. You can just say, let me tell you what he's done for me. Right? So that's your your homework assignment. This is that passion for Jesus. The other one is in Colombia. And I don't know if you've met these guys yet. There's a group of guys that we work with in Colombia called 
MMM, Mission Mundial something. I never can remember the last word. These are church planters who work in the red zones in southern Colombia, among the FARC rebels, the ELN. There's all kinds of rebels in these areas. And they tightly control these areas. Um, one of the joys of my being at VOM is sending Gordon to Colombia, not to get him killed, but to do ministry. But we, we meet these guys and we talk with them. And, and here's what we find out. Mission Mundial, they send, only send church planters to the red zones. Their whole thing is we're going to go where there are no churches and we're going to plant churches, right? This is unbelievably dangerous. If you want to go with Mission Mundial to the red zones, you have to sign a document. And that document has three statements on it that you have to affirm if you want to go. And I, I want you to think about, it, as I tell you this, if you could do that, if you could imagine doing this. The first statement says, I'm as right with God as I know how to be. It's Sunday, it's a good day, we just sang some worship songs. I think I could say, yeah, I'm as right with God as I know how to be. Second statement, I have said goodbye to my friends and family. Right, who signs that, right? But you got to, and if your wife's going with you, she has to sign it as well. And the third statement, I will not run. I will not run. Could you imagine, what, what, what does your relationship with Jesus have to be like to sign a document like that? It's certainly more than what I affectionately call the country club church, right? It's certainly more than someone who, their idea of the Christian life is I get up on Sunday and I dress up a little bit, less now, but I still dress up a little bit, and I go to church and I get a warm fuzzy from the music, and then Gordon preaches a, an encouraging word, and then I go about my life like it doesn't exist until the next Sunday. You would never sign that document, right? Mission Mundial has a waiting list of people we know of at least four martyrs in that network in the last two years. All those guys get beaten and attacked regularly, and they continue to go, they continue to go. So the first lesson, really, from the, our persecuted brothers and sisters is this. You have to have this passion for Jesus that would drive you to take risk. Now, risk is different everywhere we go, right? There's probably not, there may be a place in Tulsa, I have no idea, but there's not many places here that if you go and you try to share the gospel that they're going to kill you, right? But there's a lot of places in Tulsa that if you go and share the gospel, they're going to give you a hard time. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to think you're weird or you're odd for God. Do it. Does your passion for Jesus drive you to do that? I pray that it does. The second thing that we find is this, a passion for his word, a passion for his word. I know this church, been in this church for more than 40 years, gosh, more than 50 years now? I know this church is a church that believes in a passion for God's word, that God's word is precious, right? And I, I pray that that would continue. And if that's not you, man, I pray this morning, if nothing else, man, you, you renew that passion for this word. God's word is living and active, right? It's the only book that we have that's alive. It's the only book I know of that people will risk their life to have, will risk their life to have. I'll tell you a funny story from Cuba, funny to me, kind of, we have a partner in Cuba who prints Bibles, scripture portions and Bibles. And if you were to go to his, I think I've told you guys a little bit about this guy. If you were to go to his, his place, which you'll go next year, there's broken down cars out front. It looks like a shop, like where you would go to get your car worked on. <clears throat> but if you go to the back of it, there's fingerprint security to go into a modern printing press, right? And they're printing scripture portions almost all the time, round the clock. We have, to, we have to smuggle paper to them, have to smuggle ink, they get the Bibles. Well, they were frustrated, this brother was frustrated because they, their truck had broke down and they couldn't deliver the scriptures anymore across Cuba. Now, remember in Cuba, it's not like us where we say, oh, I need a new car, so you go down to Jim Nelson or whatever and buy one. You can't buy one, right? It's a communist country. So their truck, I wish you could see their truck. It's about a 1940s truck. Looks like something from like a World War II supply vehicle, right? And it's, when I was there, it was all broken down and they had asked us, can you help us fix this truck? And I, being an American, said, well, why don't we just buy them a new truck? And they said, if we had a million dollars, we couldn't buy a new truck, but we need a lot of money to fix this truck. And so it came to our committee, how we make decisions at VOM, and we approved the buying of the, or the repair of this truck. And I had the privilege of going to Cuba, and I got to talk to this guy. And one of the guys who worked for me went up to him and said, hey, brother, they approved the repair of your truck. 
And he laughed and he said, don't lie to an old man, right? And my, the guy who worked for me said, well, hey, the jefe is here. The boss is here. You can ask him. And he came over to me and he said, is it true? Is it true that we're going to be able to fix the truck? And I said, yeah, brother, it's true. We've got the funds. We're going to do it. We're going to fix it. He broke down and cried because they would be able to put the word of God across Cuba because of fixing a little truck, right? I, I have written down here, making an old man cry. I guess I'm an old man. But the value of the scriptures, man, having that, whatever it takes to get it. Sometimes it's funny the way God works to put the scriptures in people's hands. It was in Lebanon, uh, and I got to meet one of our staff who was a part of one of the craziest stories we've heard this year at Voice of the Martyrs. And he, did, he said this. He said, we had a new church plant in Syria, just over the Syrian border. They called us. They wanted Bibles. Can we get Bibles, sir? Can we please have Bibles? So they made arrangements. They met up in a mountain pass at midnight on a Thursday, and he brought them one case of Bibles. And they said, oh, sir, we need so many more Bibles. Can you please help us get more Bibles? He said, well, you didn't say how many you wanted, so I brought you a case. When they had come to meet him in the past, they had a donkey. So they take the box and they put it on the donkey and they lead the donkey back into Syria. A couple weeks later, they come and said, we really need more Bibles. Can you bring us 200 Bibles? And he called us and we said, absolutely, give them all the Bibles they want. So he, said, he called and he said, yes, we'll do it. I will meet again on Thursday night. I'll meet you at the same place up in that mountain pass and I'll give you the Bibles. They said, great. The day before, on Wednesday, they send him an SMS, a text, and says, they said, something has come up, and we're not going to be able to be there tomorrow night, but we're going to send the donkey, right? And he said, that's weird. I thought maybe they fat-fingered that, right? They're going to send a mule, someone else, right? So we're going to send a donkey. He said, well, they're great men of faith, so I thought I might as well do it. So he gets 200 Bibles, he walks up, he's waiting in the pass, and he was telling me the story, he said, I'm standing there, it's midnight, I'm in a mountain pass, it's a dangerous place, and I'm waiting for a donkey. And he thought, this is silly. And he said, I told the Lord, five minutes, Lord, and I'm out of here. And about that time, he looks down the road, and there's a donkey walking up the road. And he said, can't be this donkey, right? Can't be this donkey. I mean, coincidence happened, it can't be that donkey. And it came up, and it stopped right next to him. And he said, okay, Lord. And he put the 200 Bibles on the donkey and he turned it around and he slapped it on the backside and it took off back down the road. Two days later, he gets an SMS. We got our Bibles. Thank you very much, right? How how passionate, how interested is God in getting his word to his people? He would send a donkey in Syria to do that. I'm going to speed up because I'm going to run out of time for the video and prayer. So, So a passion for Jesus, a passion for his word, a passion for his presence. Some of you guys remember John Biak? Do you remember John Biak from Burma? He stood right here in this pulpit. John Biak is one of the best examples of prayer that I've ever met. Because John sends these church planters out into very difficult places to do ministry. Young 18, 19 year olds. Can you imagine going out for three years, right? To try to plant a church. And I asked him once, how do you do it? How do you get them to stay? And he said, it's about Fridays. And I said, oh, TGI Fridays? He said, no, not TGI Fridays, Fridays. He said, on Fridays we get together, everyone who can, and we pray and we fast. He said, and that's the secret. We pray and we fast that God would give us the strength to stay and to do ministry. I still get emails from John sometimes on Thursday saying, hey, we're gonna pray tomorrow. Is anything we can pray for you about? Right? This idea of the presence of God, of this passion for his presence and to pray. I want to tell you my favorite story, kind of creepy story, but I'm going to tell you anyway, because you guys know me, Uh, some of you do. The craziest thing about the power and presence of God that I have encountered, I was in North India, and we're meeting with a bunch of church planters up in northern UP state, a very hostile area right on the Nepali border, and they're telling us their stories. For about three hours, we're listening to stories, crazy stories, amazing stories, But there was one gentleman sitting in the back who hadn't said anything. And someone turned and they said, oh, you should tell them your story. And he stood up and he said, okay. He said, well, I pastored a small church, about 80 people in a village, right? Think big city in India, a village is 50,000 people. I I pastored this church. We had a lot of opposition. A lot of people hated us. And they would play loud music during our services. They would throw rocks at us. And... One day, on a Saturday, a young lady in our church passed away. She died in the hospital. He said, so the next morning, we were gathered as a church, about 80 people, 
and we were praying for the family and trying to minister to the family. And while we were doing that, Hindus went to the hospital and they stole the body, right? And he said they brought the body to our church. Now imagine this, Eastwood. In the middle of their service, Hindus knock the door in and come in yelling and screaming and they've got this dead girl from the church and they laid her on the platform and they said, what will your God do? Now this is a power encounter, right? Hinduism is all about power. Your God has to be more powerful or I'm not going to serve him, right? What will you do? And I looked at this pastor and said, holy cow, what did you do? He said, we didn't know what to do because we weren't a Pentecostal church, right? And he said, so, so we just began to pray, right? And I thought, well, that's, that's a good move, right? So they began to pray. The most amazing part of the story, he said, after 45 minutes, her eyes began to flutter. Now, the amazing thing about that story is not that her eyes began to flutter, but that a church, a group of folks like this, prayed 45 minutes surrounded by Hindus for a dead girl. He said, after 45 minutes, her eyes began to flutter. And I said, what were you praying? He goes, I was praying, God, you have to show up. You have to show up. He said, at an hour, she sat up on the stage. And I said, wow. I said, what did you do? As a great pastor or preacher would say, he said, I preached the gospel, right? And what happened? Their church runs about 800 people now. I tell you that story. You hear these stories sometimes and think, oh, I don't know if that's true. But I'll tell you this. I've interviewed that pastor and I've interviewed that girl. So I will tell you, as far as I can figure out, that happened. This girl who had died was raised by the prayers of, her, of God's people. That doesn't happen all the time. It happens more often than you might think in some places like India. But God is on the move, right? These are the most exciting days to be alive in the history of the church. And you and I get to be a part of that and get to play a role. Final thing, a passion for his family. I want to tell you a story about a pastor in northern Nigeria. I met him, I think, last year. We're meeting with this group of pastors, and this pastor pastors a church that's on the main road that comes out of Cameroon into northern Nigeria. This is where the, the Boko Haram troops, who mostly live in Cameroon, this is where they come into Nigeria and kill, they've killed tens of thousands of people so far. This pastor is telling us a story. He sent his family six hours away, his wife and children, so they'll be safe. Could you imagine, Gordon, if you had to send your family to Dallas so you could still do ministry? He said, I sent them six hours away. Everyone in the village is saying, they're going to kill you. Your church is right on the road. They're going to kill you, right? And yet he's still there. And I ask him this question that I ask a lot of times and usually feel like the least spiritual guy in the room. Why do you stay? Why do you stay? Why would any pastor stay? Why would any Christian stay? And he looked at me like I was crazy. And he, looked at me, he said, brother, what would happen to my flock if I run? If I run, what will happen? And he paused, he said, and what about the gospel? They need to hear the gospel, right? This passion for, for God's family, our family. This is our family, Eastwood Baptist Church. These stories are stories from your family. These are not some other religion somewhere. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. They are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And what they ask for you is to pray. Please pray for us. So what can you do? Three things you can do, and I've brought some stuff to help, I hope. One, get informed. Learn. Pay attention to what God is doing in the earth. You don't have to watch Fox News 23 hours a day. You can, you can take an hour and read uh, about what God is doing in the earth. Outside on the table, next to Michelle and Ryan's stuff, which how awesome is it to have them here as well this morning, you'll find newsletters from our ministry. They're free. Take all you want. If you've got friends, you go, oh, I want to give this to some people. Take all you want. But read that. You can fill that out. We'll send you a free subscription forever. We'll send you every month what God is doing around the world. Begin to learn. Begin to learn so that you can pray. <coughs> Begin to tell their stories. Begin to tell their stories. Read that newsletter and tell your friends. I got to tell you, this is the most incredible. They had a donkey. A donkey showed up in the hills, right? Tell those stories to people so that you can encourage them and challenge them. And finally, pray. Pray. Set aside a few minutes every day. There's a, a friend of ours has a ministry that has, it's called 838. I think you could find him on Facebook too. 
Every day at 8.38, every evening at 8.38, they ask people to pause for a minute and pray for the persecuted church. Do that. Pick a time that you would pray every day for our persecuted family around the world. Amen? And then do it. Actually do it. Don't, don't sit on Sunday morning and say, I'm going to pray for the persecuted church. No, go home and do it. If you're doing it on Thursday, I'll believe that you're, you're really committed to that. Right? Go and pray. We have an app you can find in the app store called Pray Today. We'll give you prayer requests every day. We have a website called I Commit to Pray. We put new prayer requests up there all the time, but pray. But as we come to, I guess it's the invitation. I haven't been in a Baptist church in a while. As we come to the invitation, here's the invitation this morning. The invitation this morning is to to just look at your life. Look at your Christian life. and, And look at your passion for Jesus. And your passion for his word and for his presence and for his family. Are you where God wants you to be? And if you're not, man, call out to him. If you, if we're not going to hand out MMM cards and ask you to say you've said goodbye to your friends and family, but are you as right with God as you know how to be? If you're not, there's no reason to not get that settled this morning. If you don't know Jesus, to come and talk to counselors down here and learn more about what it means to follow Jesus. All right? So we're going to bow our heads. Close our eyes, and I'm going to pray, and then you can come. Father, I thank you that you allow us to be a part of your family around the world. Father, that we have the privilege to stand with them, to be encouraged and be challenged by them. And Lord, I pray you would speak to our hearts this morning. Father, may we be worthy of our family. May we live a life that brings glory and honor to your name. And Father, if there's someone here who doesn't know you this morning, Lord, I pray you would move on their heart, you would soften their heart, that they might come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us. And we pray that you have sensed God's presence in this service and that he has spoken to you through his word. No matter where you're at in your relationship with God, we want you to know that he loves you. Maybe you're in a growing relationship with him, and that is awesome. But maybe today you have been away from God and you really sense him drawing you back to himself. Maybe today you're ready to begin that relationship with him. Will you pray with me today? Father God, we believe that Jesus is your son and that he came to take our sin away. Lord, we trust you. What Jesus did is enough for us. So we ask you to forgive us of our sin, come into our lives, and begin to change us. We ask that in Jesus' name, amen. We would love to hear about your decision today. So if you'd click the Help and Hope button right here on this page, or simply email us at eastwood at eastwoodtulsa.org. We're gonna pray with you, and we're gonna partner with you in this journey as you become all that God has created you to be. Once again, God bless you, and thank you for joining us.